Okay, if Michael and Alexandra are ready, um, I think we could get started. I've got a few things to say beforehand, so it's not like I'm going to let them talk immediately, so people still have time to join us. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us for our inaugural BSB at Home virtual reading series. Um, we couldn't be happier to have Michael and Alexandra, who are both dear friends of the bookstore, um, for our first reading. Um, I will tell you a little bit about Buffalo Street Books beforehand. Uh, we are Ithaca's community-owned independent bookstore. Uh, we are unique in that we are owned by about 900, give or take a few members of our community who are very, very invested in uh, keeping our little indie bookstore going. And uh, so that's great. Right now we are um, up and running with online sales and we are offering curbside pickup if we can't, you know, for any books you order, sometimes it takes longer if they're not right in the store, but we're doing our best to fulfill orders um, even as the stores close. Basically, I'm doing my best because I'm the one person show, um, but it's great to have all the support of the community. So you can always um, go to that site, um, www.buffalostreetbooks.com at our online store and shop for books. And especially we recommend shopping for books by Alexandra Chang and Michael Pryor. Um, and uh, I also wanna quickly mention that I said, this is the first in our series and we have a couple of other events already scheduled coming up in May. On May 12th, we're gonna have the authors, Kate Milliken and Anna Solomon, um, who both have brand new books out. Um, I'm letting a little cat out of the bag by telling you that both of them are selections for our um, BSB First Fiction Subscription Book Club too. So uh, Kate's our April book. And if anybody's a subscriber, you already know now that your May book will be Anna Solomon's The Book of Bee. And we're really excited about that. They'll be in conversation with Eleanor Henderson. And then on May 15th, we're hosting debut author um, and YA author Rocky Callen her, with her book, A Breath Too Late. And we're presenting that in partnership with NAMI Finger Lakes, uh, the Sophie Fund and the Tompkins County Advocacy Center. So we hope you'll be able to join us for those events and others as we unfold more over the coming weeks. But for now, we're all here because we wanna learn more about what Alexandra and Michael have to share with us in their new books. Um, as I said, both Alexandra and Michael have been friends of the bookstore for a long time. I remember when I first started being the general manager of the bookstore, Michael was already well established as an attached um, Cornell. He was at Cornell at the time teaching and he ran many, many an event and very well. Um, and then, um, Al and he and Alex have both been strong customers of the store and it was especially sweet last year as they both knew their books were going to be coming out. And I, I honestly cannot count how many different times this happened, but many, many times I would come upon them together in the store, browsing the shelves and chattering and discussing very fervently what they wanted their book covers to look like while they were looking at other people's book covers. So that's a really sweet memory to have as we see their books out in, and actually published now. And um, I've read both of them and their lovely works. And so it's really exciting to have them here. So first I think Michael is going to read. So let me tell you a little bit about Michael. Um, he is a writer and teacher. His poems have appeared in Poetry, The New Republic, Narrative, The Academy of Mer Poets, American Poets Poem A Day series, The Margins and Poetry Northwest. His first full length collection, Model Disciple was published by vehicle i'm not going to be able to say that properly press in 2016 and was named one of the best books of the year by the canadian broadcasting corporation his second collection burning province was published by mcclelland and stewart penguin random house this march michael holds graduate degrees from the university of toronto and cornell university and he divides his time between vancouver british columbia and st paul minnesota welcome michael thank you so much lisa um, it's so wonderful to be here. Um, thank you, Eleanor and Alexandra, too, um, for being big parts in putting this together. Um, and thank you to everyone who, who showed up. It's so lovely to see so many familiar names in the scroll on the right-hand side of my screen. Um, 
Yes, Alexandra's holding up the book. Um, so I'm gonna just read three poems today. Um, I always like to tell people how many poems I'm gonna read so you can count them off in your head. Um, the book focuses a lot on the Japanese Canadian internment during the Second World War. Um, and my maternal grandparents were interned. And the first poem in the book, uh, the first one I'm gonna read is uh, a poem that responds to a, an art project by a Japanese Canadian artist, Kayla Isomura. Um, Isomura um, took the original internment orders, you know, the, the, the notices that said people had to basically gather what they could and that they were going to be you know, shipped to these camps and um, all their, the rest of their properties and possessions would be stripped from them. Um, and she presented these original orders to um, uh, Japanese Canadians and Japanese Americans now in uh, California, Washington, Oregon, uh, British Columbia. And then she asked them to pack their bags as if they're going to the internment and took photographs uh, of what they packed. And so this poem is called 150 pounds, um, which is the amount of baggage that an adult uh, was allowed to take with them to the camps. So 150 pounds after Kayla Isumura's The Suitcase Project. In some, the luggage lies open like a mouth mid-sentence. In others, closed zippers grimace. What would you have brought? Slippers, a stuffed platypus, a gold watch on a chain, copper pot swaddled in bedding. The hypotheses that thinking can be things, that each decision shrinks a pain mind to the space inside a suitcase. Include lacquered chopsticks, silver forks, a hammer scarred by rust, the orders nailed to telephone poles and doors. Omit what you whispered then, most of what you've seen. I was given 48 hours notice, 24. I passed ice and pines and plains. I rode an iron serpent into the interior beside 400 others. It was humid. It was cold. If pain is remembered to be dismissed, if fear still seeds its rotting forest, this is a gardener's trowel, a blue skein of yarn, a violin, a ukulele, a ukulele, a ukulele. This is a porch light flicked on and off an abscessed night. These are pear blossoms falling on the driveway like footprints in black ice. Memories, river stones, metamorphic and worn. How many might an able-bodied individual carry through livestock stalls and mud onto a bus, a train, into a tiny uninsulated shack? Most say the same. It could happen again. It is happening now. I couldn't make room for a dogless collar, a hound's tooth scarf, a steel urn packed in styrofoam, a letter recording bloods to visit fractions. My father would not have come, my mother, my stepsister, my brother. What matters is not what you bring, but what you keep. She was there, he was too. Um, part of the book project, I guess, is a series of elegies uh, for people of my grandparents' generation um, who were the last you know, living witnesses to the internment. Um, and this is an elegy from my grandmother who passed away when I started writing this book. Um, she was a really incredible woman. She raised me when I was young. Uh, she was orphaned in the camps actually. Um, and like many other Japanese Canadians and Japanese Americans, she kind of adopted and stuck with an English name uh, after the war. Um, and so I never actually knew her Japanese name until she was until she was dying. Um, so this is a poem about her and about the years directly after the war. Um, it's called, My Pronunciation Was Wrong. She said, forget the dishes, and he hit me with a wooden spoon until I bled. Passed from one family to another in the camp, she wore tin cans like stilts, drew circles in the dirt. She wasn't my mother at first. Terrible at blackjack, Texas Hold'em, her stepfather sent letters frantic for cash, each written in a different hand. Penticton, Kelowna, no Japs from the Rockies to the sea. Baskets of Brayburn, serene the orchard's auburn waves of leaves and branches. School all day, worked until she slept, ironed and swept, 
fried kippers and eggs, put someone else's kids to bed, the smell of dried fish. Everyone fights sometimes, it's fine, they fed me every day. Her husband shouted in his sleep about sawmills, houses built from dust. She tended theirs, pruned the garden's rising swaths of summer. There was too much left unsaid. To me, she caught a ganai and leave your sister alone. She liked pickled chiso, Sir Roger Moore, and Hallmark Christmas ornaments. Disliked flying and talking about the past. Once I watched her feed sugar water to a honeybee with a spoon. Silver coins she couldn't afford slipped from her palm to mine. She said, don't tell your mother and farted is an excellent word. A man lost all her money twice. Salt water, slatted blinds, sallow moon that spawns along the Fraser, Riverside apartments in diminishing square footage, Coquitlam to Richmond, Richmond to Surrey, that undistinguished block of Hastings where her stepmother's shop once stood. In front of us, she never said her given name. I started with the first poem in the book, so I'm gonna end with the, the last poem in the book, which is, um, I guess, the closest to a love poem I can write. Um, it, the poem begins with an epigraph um, from the medieval Japanese monk Kenko um, from a, a, a series of zuitsu he wrote, which are kind of like essays and fragments. Um, and the quote is, uh, or the epigraph is, you should never put the new antlers of a deer to your nose and smell them. They have little insects that crawl into the nose and devour the brain. Wakeful things. Consider that the insects might be metaphor, that the antler's wet velvet scent might be Proust's Madeline dipped into a cup of tea, adorned with centrifugal patterns of azalea and willow, those fleshing the hill behind this room, walls wreathed in smoke and iron, musk of the deer head above the mantle. He was nailed in place before I was me. Through the floorboards, a caterpillar stripped from its chrysalis by red ants wakes as if to a house of flame. Silk frays like silver horns, like thoughts branching from a brain. After the MRI, my father's chosen father squinted at the wormholes raveling the screen and said, be good to one another. Love, how inelegantly we leave, how insistent we are to return in one form or another. I wish all of this and none of it for us. More sun, more tempest, more fear and fearlessness, more of that which is tempered, carved and worn, creased into overlapping planes. The way I feel the world's aperture enlarge in each morning's patchwork blur of light and color while I fumble for my glasses beside the bed, lenses smudged by both our hands. When they were alive, those antlers held up the sky. Now what do they hold? Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, I didn't say this at the beginning, but the way we're gonna operate today is um, each of them, each of our authors is going to read and then they're gonna have a bit of a conversation with each other and then we'll take questions at the end. If any of you have questions, you can just, um, put them in chat or try to wave your hands around and I'll try to catch you. Um, so now we're going to move on to Alexandra Ching. <clears throat> Alexandra is the author of the debut novel Days of Distraction, published on March 31st by Echo HarperCollins. Her short fiction has appeared in Catapult, Glimmer Terrain, LA LA Review of Books Quarterly June Journal, Room, 3AM Magazine, and Zoetrope. All story, where she won first prize in the 2017 short fiction competition. She received her MFA in fiction from Syracuse University. She's from Northern California and currently lives in Ithaca, New York with her husband and their dog and cat, Alexandra. Thank you so much, Lisa. Is this an okay volume? I think it's, it always has an issue with Zoom, like becoming the main speaker view. 
Um, I don't know if there's a way to like make it. Let's see. Eleanor, do you know if there is? It's okay. You it's sound fine. good to me. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Great. Um, well, thank you, Michael. That was a really beautiful reading. Um, and thank you, Lisa and Eleanor and Buffalo Street Books for hosting us. Uh, yeah, Michael and I used to get brunch and go and look at book covers a lot. Uh, that was like one of my favorite pastimes. <laughs> and we'll talk about that a little bit more after I read. Um, in honor of, I guess, like technic technically I've been reading in Ithaca this entire time since my book came out. But since this is like an actual reading through our local bookstore, uh, I thought I'd read a section that I've not read before, and it's the opening of the Ithaca section of the book. Um, what you need to know is basically that this, the narrator of the novel has moved from San Francisco to Ithaca after a cross-country road trip with her boyfriend, essentially to follow him as he uh, starts graduate school at Cornell, and uh, she's a little bit ambivalent about the move when she arrives in Ithaca. At first, everything has a hint of the ancient and crumbling. On the way in, we pass an incredible number of cemeteries littered haphazardly and crowded with old tombstones. Reminders of how long people have lived here, have walked these parts and died in these parts. It is quiet, the living people appear to move slower. The humidity has followed us here and been amplified. It weighs everything down. Through the car window, Jay points out the sidewalks curbed with long granite slabs instead of the usual cement, an unusual feature I should appreciate. But all of this eventually leads to open air shopping plazas of big American business. The transition from old to new is seamless. Those recognizable corporate names give Ithaca a grander status as though it's not a college town, but a small city. Somebody explained to Jay, who now explains to me, that people from surrounding areas come to Ithaca to do their shopping. It is the destination for those within an hour's drive, and the people who come down from the hills aren't as nice or cultured as Ithacans. But to me, upon first glance, it looks very much like the places we passed in the middles of nowheres. I'm not going to say you deceived me, I say, half joking. No, you'll see, it's going to be great. The couple's apartment is modern, clean, and well-furnished. The air is thickly sweet. We wander from room to room, turn on all the lights, hold up the framed photos of them, two attractive blondes always smiling, arms wrapped around waists, in front of trees and mountains and old buildings. We peruse the bookshelves full of self-help and business books, smell the candles left in each room, and test out their mattress just the right amount of give. On their fridge, in script font against bright colored backgrounds, quote magnets. Home is where the heart is, Joseph C. Neal, and be the change you wish to see in the world, Gandhi. And what would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail, unknown? I read them to Jay and we laugh at their cheesiness. A bottle of wine left on the dining room table is accompanied by a note on a piece of monogrammed paper. Welcome to Ithaca, local beer also in the fridge, smiley face. The bathroom is tiny, he reports. How bad? I find him sitting on the toilet in a closet-like room. At least close the door. I'm suffocating now, he cries. I stand in the living room and examine the put-togetherness of the place. The house oozes its positivity and there's no escaping its reach. If two grad students can afford to live like this, then yeah, I could definitely get used to it. We'll need a bigger bathroom though, he says from the other side. Maybe even two, we can dream big here. We take an evening walk to one of the downtown waterfalls a few blocks away. Another defining feature of the place all of the water, the lakes, the creeks, the gorges, and its proximity to everyday life. Here it is raging, loud and white against dark rock cut jagged and deep for millennia. 
The sound of it is overpowering. The mist cools our faces. This isn't boring, I yell over the water's crash. Thank you. Thanks, Alexandra. It was really yeah. fun to hear you reading that, that piece, especially uh, <laughs> picturing our little, yeah. our little oasis, so to speak. <laughs> so um, yeah, so we were just going to let you and Michael talk to each other. Sounds good. Um, Michael, did yes, you? Yes, I think we prepared some questions. Yes, for we did. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I guess I'll thank you for that really lovely reading, Alexandra. Um, thank you for yours. It's a, it's such a gorgeously made and such a smart book. Um, I wanted to ask you a little, I think re listeners might have picked up on it from the way you were moving there when you're reading, but um, the book is written in like vignettes and kind of fragments your book. Um, and I was wondering like how you settled upon this kind of form for the novel. Uh, because to me, it seemed very important formally as a way of kind of interrogating, I mean, many things, the complexities of an interracial relationship, um, the sort of what Kathy Park Hong calls the vague purgatorial status of Asian Americans and the popular imagination. But it just felt like a really apt kind of craft choice. And I wonder how you arrived at it. I, I arrived at it not super consciously. I don't think I was making the, I landed at the form probably before I realized what the book was about. So I think I shaped the story a little bit more to the form um, than vice versa. But yeah, the fragmented vignettes, like those work really well to dramatize a narrator's um a narrator who is going through some sort of transition um, and is grasping at some, like an attempt to find some sense of self, uh, but then lapsing back into like shame and doubt. And it is like purgatorial, like um, you're saying, but it was a form I think that like I started writing in first before I realized what this novel was going to be about. So that was something that I wanted to ask you because in poetry, it seems like it's much more common to like work with constraints, work with like inherited verse forms. Like, I mean, I'm not super familiar with a lot of them, but like the sonnet and like Sistina's and, um, and then you like work within that constraint. So I was wondering if like, when you're writing a poem, if you like fit the, fit the poem like the content I guess if you could say content of a poem but like imagery and like theme of a poem to fit like the structure and like the form or if you think about what you're going to write about and then think about a form that's going to work best for that topic. I mean I think it works both ways sometimes you discover the form of the poem in the, in the process of writing but um, in my book there are a lot like you said of inherited verse forms like sonnets and um, there's a villanelle and blank verse, um, which kind of that playing with those those traditions uh, was something I arrived at, I guess, early in the process of, of writing the book, because for me, they seemed like apt kind of metaphors, formal metaphors um, for like the psychological and physical uh, constraints of the camps. Um, it seemed like an interesting way of evoking that or exploring that. Um, and I also tell my students all the time that like form is often generative, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I often start poems in one form and that's what I needed to like to get somewhere new in the poem and it ends up being something different, but I needed to start somewhere with some sort of container. So, okay. Yeah. So you'll sometimes start with like a certain form and then change it later. Like, sure. oh, this yeah. is not working for me, but just like as like a generative tool. Yeah. I mean, the first that's poem cool. I read started off as a series of elegiac stanzas, which is like mm -hmm. iambic pentameter quatrains. Um, and then it, it ended up not being that, but it would, it seemed like an appropriate choice to start with and it helped me get going. So. Yeah. I feel like constraints are helpful in terms of like, at least when I have a writer's block or something, or like, I'm not able to like think of what to write. If I give myself some sort of constraint, then it's like easier to at least like work towards something instead of having like too many options. Yeah. I don't know. I think of, um, I mean, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of your work, as you know, and I think of like the story you you uh, you published that won the Zoetrope Prize, right, which has a very particular form, which is a series of again vignettes, but with uh, these interesting kind of headings or titles 
that often work ironically with what comes after. Um, and so I was wondering for like this book, what, who were some of the people that influenced you in terms of form or like writers you were reading that were helpful? Mm -hmm. uh, Mary Robeson's Why Did I Ever, which I feel like is probably one of the great fragmented novels. Um, Valeria Luiselli's Faces in the Crowd was really helpful when I was like starting very like early stages of revision, still like actually writing probably. Um, and Annalise Chen's So Many Olympic Exertions I read also um, during revision. So those were all like, oh, and Renata Adler's Pitch Dark, which I prefer over Speedboat. Um, but I think Speedboat is more, more well known. Um, yeah, so reading those like fragmented novels really helped. But like, it's interesting because like every, those novels all use the fragment really differently. And same with the um, zoetrope story that you're talking about, like the fragments there, um, they're used to like compress time. Um, and then in this novel, the fragments are more used to like dramatize disorder and um, the like haphazard motion of thought for this narrator. Um, I also, okay, moving on from form, since I think it's a little like writerly heavy, uh, we are both writing about, um, you know, Asian diaspora experience, like, I guess our work could both be categorized as like literature by Asian diaspora. You're writing about um, Japanese Canadian internment and like sort of the inherited um, trauma, would you say, I guess, like of that experience from uh, your grandparents having gone through that. And I was wondering if that was something that you knew you were going to tackle in this, because this is your second book. Um, and your first book does address some of that as well, but not maybe as like directly around um, internment. Um, so I was just wondering like how you approached the project and like how you came up with like what you were going to write about in this book. Yeah, I mean, I think it did grow out of the first book. I mean, I think near the end of the first book, there were a series of poems that like very much more directly than the rest of the book kind of took on these themes or these issues. And I think it, it grew out of that, out of, out of like a series of questions that I had left unanswered at the end of that book that I wanted to maybe not answer, but like extend and complicate. Um, so that's kind of where the second book came out of. I mean, more generally, the internment as a kind of like, I get cultural trauma, but also as a family mythology has always yeah. been on the kind of peripheries of my experience, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was talked about um, in my family, um, um, but I never think I really understood it till I reached a certain age. It's not something that there's a lot of space devoted to in Canadian school curriculum either. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's changed since I went through like, <laughs> Uh, elementary and high school and stuff. But um, yeah, so I think it was this thing that was always kind of pressing uh, at the edges uh, of my perspective. And so I wanted to, to, to think more about that. Um, and I also realized that like, I became interested in this book in particularly, and I guess like tropes of the pastoral and how that might be a way of thinking through the fact that many of these spaces in German camps and such are no longer they're no longer there in a physical sense. They've been like overlaid or erased. Um, mm -hmm. The camp where my grandparents was is now an RV park. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so are there like no, are there no even like memorials or like any camps that have like been maintained in Canada? There are memorials and there are, and like, for example, this one attached me where my grandparents were. Um, mm -hmm. They recently built a small, the owner of the RV park <laughs> recently built a small museum and put up a plaque. But you know, many of them, yeah, are just completely are farmland now or wilderness in the interior of British Columbia. Um, so I wanted to try and like reimagine those spaces and rewitness those spaces. Um, how about for you and your novel? How did you come to the kind of this very complex uh, working through of like an interracial relationship? Um, was that something you, you, you were going to write about from the start? Um, was that something you entered your MFA thinking about or? No, I, I don't think so. I don't, I don't really go into writing like my stories or I mean, this is the only novel I've ever written and I haven't attempted to write another. Uh, so any of my fiction, I don't really go in with like a, a clear plan. Um, I'm trying now to like come up with a plan before I write something. Um, but for this one, no, I was writing 
sort of uh, whatever came to mind in this document uh, where I was like collecting musings and character sketches and scenes. And um, I think it was just something that I was, that was like on my mind a lot. I mean, I am in an interracial relationship with a white man. So um, it was something that I don't know. I guess I was thinking more about at that when I first started writing um, and I wanted to interrogate a little bit more than I had before. Um, I think, I think it's easy to like go about in your day-to-day -day life just being like, oh, everything's fine as it is. So no reason to like question something really deeply because it's like, it's sort of like the I don't want to rock the boat mentality. Uh, but with writing this novel, <laughs> I, I can hear my husband laughing in the background. Um, with writing this novel, I was like, okay, well now I have the space and like the time and um, this like page, this like fictional world, even though it is, is drawn from my own life, this fictional world where I can uh, more deeply explore these questions that maybe I haven't given myself the time and the space to think like super critically about uh before or at least not as much as i did in this book in writing this book and um so the novel begins with the narrator as like a tech journalist in san francisco which is you know <laughs> not a biographical resonance for you because you did that for quite a while mm -hmm. um and then it, it like there's this road trip um when the, the narrator's partner is accepted to a graduate program mm -hmm. at a university in Ithaca, um, yeah. and they go on this road trip across the country together. Um, and when did that, was that something that emerged early in the process of writing the novel, or how did you decide to no. base so much of it on the road trip part? Yeah, the road trip part, actually, I included later, because um, in, like, the first, like, I guess, draft, it's not really, it wasn't really a draft, it was just sort of like pages of stuff. Um, I had a lot about like every single job that this narrator had ever had. And I thought I was like writing like a work novel of some sort where it was just like this job, that job, this job. Um, and then I realized like, okay, that's not really interesting to just, uh, at least for me, like, and I realized there were other th aspects of the novel that were more interesting um, for for me to be writing. and that's when like the road trip came in just to have like um, an actual like tie and movement from like San Francisco to Ithaca because I realized that I had a lot of sections set in San Francisco, a lot of sections set in Ithaca. Um, well, now I have to write like how this narrator actually gets from one place to the other. Uh, but yeah, I took a road trip out here too. So that's a that's a, an autobiographical detail. Um, I was curious, this is not one of our planned questions, but it, think, talking about this, I started thinking about how your book, like especially the poems that you read, you're being inspired by like a work of art or another piece of, um, I guess another work of art too, like a piece of literature. Um, and, you know, in, in my book, like I take a lot from like history too, and you do too. So I'm just wondering like, how not only like form is a is generative for you but how like these outside sources these other works of art help you create your own art right um i mean yes i think of your book like which includes a huge amount of like uh excerpts from historical documents and stuff right as this narrator tries to figure out a kind of like lineage for herself right um for me as like in the writing process i hmm, that's a great question um <laughs> I guess part of it is like, I figure for me as a, I tell my students this, so I should probably, maybe I practice this too. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm just lying. But like um, part of putting together a collection is figuring out what conversations you are having and what is the grammar of those conversations um, and the grammar for poetry, right? Is metaphor and image and form. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, I, I find a particular, it doesn't have to be a lot of things, but a poem or two, a work of art or something that inspires a whole series of conversations and like formal riffs on it. Um, so like the, the Kenko collection of Vuitsu was really big. Um, the, the, the artwork that starts the book, um, but other like poems by writers like Robert Hayden and Robert mm -hmm. Lowell and Gwendolyn Brooks also play a large part in, in how I was thinking about the book too. 
Yeah. I don't know, that's kind of a non-answer, but I guess it's just, there's a lot of inspiration and that's kind of how I work because so much of this book is about indirect experience, I suppose. Um, so it's not really writing so much about like things that have happened to me, right? Um, but about mm, how the ways in which I'm trying to imagine that my experience has been shaped about the things that have happened to my family in the past. Um, and cool. so that kind of literary lineage seemed an important part of that process. Yeah, yeah. I like how there's like, this parallel between like the literary lineage and like the familial and historical lineage. Um, okay, to make it a little bit lighter, you went to the Cornell MFA in Ithaca right. yeah. and you wrote most of this book in Ithaca. That's right. So I was wondering, and, and you know, I wrote my book in Ithaca also. I was wondering how Ithaca influenced your work and, um, you know, in any way, like, scenery or like imagery or even just like your writing community in Ithaca? Ithaca is gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of gorgeous. Um, I, I love Ithaca. I mean, I think the community of the MFA was a huge part of it. And I had some really, really incredible teachers. And I met some really wonderful people there, many of whom I, I can see their names on the side of the yeah. screen. Um, who like, and I, and I met you and like, I had all these writer friends who really helped me and pushed me and challenged me to do different things and to, to write a book that was, um, that was in many ways different than what I thought it would be. Um, so I think like this, this, the friendships I formed in the community there, and Ithaca just being this wonderful place for artists, um, you know, that was all part of it. And yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, there are several poems in the book that riff on fireflies. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, because there's like- I so had never seen one before. <laughs> Me neither. Not until I moved to Ithaca. <laughs> right? So Crazy. when I moved to Ithaca, one of the most magical things was like the first summer I was there, I was feeling very depressed and like alone, not knowing anyone before, you know, classes had started. And then I looked outside and like the street was glowing. Um, another thing is, I guess, in my book has a lot of cardinals as a kind of uh, metaphor for my grandmother. Um, mm -hmm. And I, there were no cardinals back home. <laughs> Not many I saw anyhow. So they were everywhere here. Um, so I don't know, there were a lot of little things, motifs like that, that are drawn from the particular upstate New York, East Coast kind of thing. How about for you? You know, you went mm -hmm. to Syracuse. Um, you were living in Ithaca before that even. Um, so how has Ithaca shaped the novel for you? One, I mean, Ithaca is a big part of there's a I think the longest section in the novel is the Ithaca section um although the narrator isn't always like out and about in Ithaca a lot of times she's just like holed up in her house um but yeah the scenery being in like a completely new place um and on a logistical level just like on a practical level I don't think that if yeah I don't think if I had stayed in San Francisco, or even if I had moved somewhere else, like a different, like a city, um, I don't think I would have written this novel. So I, I do credit moving to Ithaca for uh, my like fiction, fiction journey. I don't know if it's a journey, and I, I don't want to call it a career, but like um, even trying to write fiction had a lot to do with moving to Ithaca. And um, yeah, going to the Syracuse MFA program, which was um, which was really lovely. Although I'm glad I wasn't living in Syracuse. I'm glad I was living in Ithaca. Actually living, uh -huh. I mean, being part of the Syracuse program made me really appreciate Ithaca a lot more because like people would come. I love Syracuse too, but I don't know what, I don't know, people who live there complain a lot. Um, about it and people would come like come and visit Ithaca and be like oh my god it's so great here it's so cute it's like the perfect like writing space like you can just take these hikes um like it's really easy to like walk from my house to these trails uh and like take my dog out so those are all things that like feed into uh the writing as well like you know it's not only like reading and doing research and like being part um, of like a literary community. It's also just like being in a space that feels nourishing. Um, yeah. And even though like the narrator is very ambivalent about Ithaca and has like a, a fraught relationship with Ithaca, I've been here for more than six years now and I've really grown to love it. So yeah, yay for Ithaca. 
<laughs> Ethos the gun deed. Um, and speaking yeah. of like, great parts of Ithaca, uh, mm -hmm. Buffalo Street books. <laughs> Buffalo Street books. <laughs> all of, I mean, all of downtown is so cute. And it's really sad that we can't walk around there right now. I know, which is what we used to do. We used to get yes. brunch, go to Buffalo Street books, look at the covers of the yeah. books on the shelves, and debate about which covers we liked. And which I know. <laughs> um, and so it's kind of like a way to end our little conversation before we mm -hmm. open it up. To the audience, I was going to ask if there are any particular book covers that you think. Are I know, <laughs> you do. You have your stack. I have my. I have my right. stack right here. I know. I wondered if we were going to have any overlap, so we're going to show some book covers that we liked, um, okay. that we've liked over. I I picked like pretty recent ones. Okay. Um. Me too. Okay. Cool. I'm going to show the one that I know is in yours as long as you have a copy because okay. we talked about how this one was like one of our favorite book covers many times at Buffalo Street Books. This one. Yes. Is it in your stack? It, it's not in my stack, but it's in oh. my house. Okay. okay. Anyway, there's a dog on it. We love yeah. dogs on covers and it's just like bright. And it's like very, I don't know. It's like, it sticks in your head. I feel like that's a, the sign of a good book cover. And just like, I'm gonna do like thematic ones and then you can pick some too. This one, because there's also a dog on the cover. And it's so clean. And like, I don't know, I like this, I like this like beige color. So that one, I like a lot. I and should note here that Alexandra, Mario Giannone, uh, Cody Klippenstein, and I were all part of the Joy Williams Book Club, which was a book club that got together every two weeks to read Joy Williams and eat cake. Yeah, and almost never like talk about the story. And never talk about the story. <laughs> and then this one too, because this one is like thematically tied because there's an animal on the cover and it's almost like a dog, but it's a fox. Foxy. What are some of yours? Because I have I like- I saw the, the Annalise Chen one there too, which was going to be one of mine. Oh yeah, I know, but this is in my other. Okay, now you go. <laughs> okay, well, I have to start with this. I think this is a fantastic oh. cover. Thank <laughs> Sorry. you. Uh, I'm doing mostly typographic covers. Okay. Um, I like this one a lot. I don't know if you yeah. It. It's a beautiful, um, and I highly recommend the book. It's Bodega uh, by Sue Wang, who's a Korean American poet, and it just won the Minnesota Book Award. It's, it's oh, shiny. cool. Um, yeah, I felt like we both were drawn to like very like graphic typogra typographic, like bright. Yeah, that makes mm -hmm. definitely. Like this too, um, On Her Feelings by Kathy Park Hong. I wish, now I'm like that font and the like the fire coming out of it could have been used for your book too. I know, actually they seem, <laughs> to, they seem to pair up very well. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean yours is also very typographic. I really love vintage book covers. So I know we were gonna do mostly new ones but I wanted to show okay. um, uh, a, one of my favorite, there's a Canadian book designer, Frank Newfeld who no one in America knows, but who's a really incredible book designer. And he uh, did all the McClellan and Stewart, which is my press, um, the Penguin Random House Canada uh, editions back in the mid century. And this is one of his. Ooh. For a poetry collection. Ooh, I really rock. like that one. Um, Wait, so this is a collection of poetry. I feel like poetry books, poetry collections have like really cool covers. Maybe more so. <laughs> Well, yeah. It's, okay. Well, I mean, they also have. I we're only like, talking about like, covers that we like. <laughs> yeah, I feel like the, the span for poetry collections is much greater than for most literary fiction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Finally, my last one is. Oh yeah, that's good too. Yeah. Back. Yes, it is. Just I have the ready. paperback of that, which is like a lot busier. Mm, okay, I like the sparser. Okay. Sparser. Well, in in line with the poetry collections. Okay, this, I don't know if this is showing up, but Mary Ruffles. Oh, yeah. Uh, most of it. Like, this is gold. There's lots of scribbles. I don't know. I just really like it. And the color is really pretty, too. Lisa, let's make this a podcast. <laughs> yeah, where we just talk about book covers. But also, okay, two, I'll just, I'll just do two more so then we can open up. But these two are tied by their shiny covers. Oh, whoa. What's the okay. second one in your this last one? hand? This one? This one. Oh, the other one, yeah. You've seen this one because we talked about this one. Oh, we yeah. We talked about liking this one. It's, wow, it's not showing up very well, but it's called Territory of Light. And it's just like this shimmery pink and white and blue. It's not actually a cover that I think like stands out uh, super well on a shelf, but like 
every time I've held it, I'm like, oh, it's so pretty. It's like, it reminds me of snow, actually. Okay. And this one is a book that's coming out in August. It's called Luster by Raven Leilani. Also, it's a really, really good book. Um, same thing where it's like shimmery cover with like a shadow of a person <laughs> in the background. I'm excited for when this comes out in hardcover because I think it's going to be even, even greater. Wonderful. Oh, someone, someone's saying that White Blight, a poetry collection, has a great cover. Ooh. I'll have to check that out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, now I guess we'd like to open it up to the audience, right? Yes. So questions. feel free to type in questions into the chat or um, unmute yourself and just ask directly. Um, otherwise, I'll have otherwise we could keep showing book yep. covers. <laughs> Okay, as people get the courage up to ask a question, here's another cover. Oh, wait, what? You have a question? Jeff does. Oh, Jeff has a question. Is it directly to you? I think it's private message to uh, you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> what was his question? What oh, Richard has a question. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, go, well, we'll do Jeff's after. Um, Richard asks, Michael, what do you think, if anything, are the main differences between Canadian and American readers? I mean, probably the first main difference is Canadian readers care about American books, but American readers don't care about Canadian books for the most part. Um, at least when it comes to poetry, I should say. I shouldn't say that about other things. That's about my field. Um, I think, I don't know. I think uh, Canada has a very strong kind of connection to the UK literary scene. Um, and that is, at least in poetry, often defines a lot of the formal features of the poetry. Um, there are probably way more Canadian writers working in a kind of like formalist vein than American writers in poetry, at least. Um, but I don't know. That's a really great question. Alexandra, what do you think, <laughs> if you were to speculate? Hmm. I don't know that much about Canadian readers, though. Uh, I don't know. I like a lot of Canadian authors um, by a lot. I'm not really sure, like, if it is a lot, but like Sheila Hetty and Margaret Atwood and Leanne Shapton. Um, those Miriam are all Taves. Writers. What was yeah. that? Miriam Taves. Mm, yeah, yeah. What was Jeff's question? I'm so curious. I want to know which drinks pair best with our books. Oh, you go first. <laughs> uh, scotch. <laughs> <laughs> Any reason why? Just because it's really the only thing I drink. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which is very cliche poet of me. How about you? Um, I already told Jeff that my answer to this question would be a cup of stress relief tea. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> so it's um, not really a, an alcoholic drink. But it is a drink that appears in my book. <laughs> my friends uh, told me that my scotch smelled like uh, diesel and, and like smoke and i was like well then that probably works for this yeah yeah that does yeah um okay there's a question from kate you use closeness to life in a fascinating and moving way in this book as a fiction writer how did you arrive at this way of writing uh i think i arrived at it intuitively naturally just like what it was what i was drawn to at the time of writing this novel. And I do think I do that a lot in my short stories too, where I like, um, I'm, I'm sort of interpreting closeness to life as like, uh, not only being like autobiographical, but also about like the smaller moments in like day to day life or the minutia of life. Um, those are the kinds of books that I like to read. Uh, Joy Williams does that really beautifully. Uh, writing about these like just I don't want to say that they're smaller experiences necessarily but they're they're less you know they're quieter moments um, that we all live through um, and they're just as important to write about as the more dramatic or like the more um, 
yeah, the, I guess dramatic, the, the bigger moments in our life too. So I think I was drawn to it just by like what I like to read and um, what felt natural to me also. Yeah. Michael, when and how did you know you wanted to be a writer? This is from oh. John. Uh, I think I, I came to it, I guess, kind of late, at least compared to like my students who talk about writing their, <laughs> like since the high school, I didn't take any creative writing classes in my undergrad. Um, I did a literature. Oh, what did you study? I studied literature. I did. Okay. Uh, um, and I really enjoyed poetry. Um, and I didn't, and I had, was forced to do a kind of creative last assignment for one of my literature classes. In my, I think it was my last year of my undergrad. And um, the professor was very encouraging. I was like, oh, maybe I should try some more of this. And <laughs> then I applied to a graduate program in Toronto, which had a creative writing component. Um, and I, I managed to get in with like, I don't know how, with like a portfolio of terrible poems. <laughs> and that's <laughs> kind of how great. I started it. Yeah. How about for you? Mm. I wrote a lot as a kid, but I don't think I ever thought like, I'm going to be a writer because it seemed very, I don't know, unrealistic to me as a, as like something that you could do with your life. Um, but yeah, I also did not take, I, actually I did take a couple creative writing uh, courses, but I, they were like application only. So I didn't get into any fiction workshops. I only got into poetry workshops. Um, and oh, my sister is messaging me privately saying, you did want to be a journalist. So I was going to say like, I knew that I wanted to, after graduating from college, I knew that I wanted to write um, in some capacity as as like my work but uh again like fiction seems like kind of absurd so journalism was a way where i like saw a path a clear path to like writing and like getting paid to write and like having um like a steady job that like required a writing and that was actually really good for my fiction writing too uh later on i realized so it wasn't until I moved to Ithaca that I even like learned about MFA programs um, that were funded. I thought that they were all just like Ponzi schemes or something. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but yeah, then I learned about funded MFA programs and I learned that there were two that were really close to here. And I was like, okay, maybe I can do this. Uh, maybe if I like get into one of these miraculously, then like, I can really focus on writing fiction. And um, I was working at Cornell at the time as a, a research writer. So writing about like research that professors did on campus. And as a staff member, I was allowed to take free courses. Um, so I took a fiction writing workshop with John Robert Lennon. And that was probably the first time I wrote a piece of fiction as an adult. Um, and one of those stories helped me get into Syracuse. So yay Cornell and yay, yay John Robert Lennon. <laughs> yeah, who is actually really great at like giving prompts with constraints that help generate interesting, sometimes very strange stories. I will never forget taking a class with John and you were in that class and yeah. <laughs> um, you wrote a story that was all one sentence. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that was hard. And I have not touched that story since. <laughs> cool any other questions um i have leah has privately messaged me to ask if i can talk about differences in publishing with a smaller press my first press vacuole which is an independent press um a long standing one but a, a smaller press in canada um versus publishing a bigger press i guess i mean the scale of things is just different um I'm not used to having a publicist. <laughs> um, but apart from that, because it's poetry, which is like, you know, not a genre that people look to to make money. <laughs> um, mm. I, it hasn't been that different a process. I mean, I have very different editors. I've had very different editors and they've both been wonderful in their own ways. Um, I don't know if I really have much to, much to say about that. Um, Did you find but, that your editor for this book was more hands-on or like more like asked more of you than your first editor? 
Um, no, actually, the editor for this book, Dion Brand, who's a fantastic poet, um, one of my favorite Adrian Rich essays ends with her saying, and we should all read Dion Brand. Um, mm. uh, but she, uh, she was uh, very hands off. We met, I think we only met once in person, but we corresponded a lot. And she presented me with a list of like six questions that she wanted me to think about, and that was it. Um, but it was really wonderful because I spent a lot of time thinking about those questions and then reworking the book. Um, so she was much more hands off. Yeah. Cool. Eleanor has a question. Can you talk about your own covers and how they came to be? You should go first. Okay. So where's my book? It's like under this stack of books. This cover took a long time. I mean, I think all covers do. Uh, more the, Now that I've heard more about like the cover processes, um, it's more amazing to me that like somebody can choose like the first cover that they're given. Actually, I think maybe did you? Well, you no. can talk about that. Um, I asked uh, the art director if they could hire an Asian, um, an Asian illustrator for the cover. And I like compiled a long list of people, uh, just like people who I had like found on Instagram or found through like their work uh, some other way and like had, co had like collected in a document. Um, and then they chose one and long story short, that woman didn't work out um, for various reasons. So then they had to go back and like look for another illustrator and they found this woman who was not on my original list. Uh, she goes by Ogig. You can find her on Instagram. I, I have no idea what her, her legal name is. Um, and they looked through like all the art director looked through all of her like for previous work and um, she found she found a version of this um, where like a woman is wearing a scarf, but it was like way higher up on her face. She had like different hair. And I asked my sister who is in here, um, who's in the Zoom right now. I was, I was like probably ranting a little bit. And I was like, we need to change the, the way she looks. I want her to like have the scarf lower on her head and I want the hair to be different. Um, and she like very quickly drew something up on her iPhone and was like, oh, like this. And I was like, yeah, like that. So I sent it back to um, the art department and they sent it to the illustrator and then they came up with the revised version, which I really love. Um, I mean, I'm crediting my sister, but of course also the illustrator was the one who actually um, made the final illustration. And then everything else, like the font, the colors, um, all of that came very easily. Like I loved the font when I saw it and, um, the background color was like always like this. I think I asked them to send me like a bunch of different versions of like the scarf color and probably spent like way too long thinking about what color I wanted for the scarf, which is ultimately like decided on the teal because it's bright. What about comment. you? I know I saw like a few, a few options yeah. <laughs> and I voted. <laughs> Um, it was a, uh, I think, I get the sense maybe that my press was a little frustrated with me. <laughs> um, but uh, the first few, I, I wanted a very bold cover and I wanted it to be typographic. Um, and um, I think they, I had sent in like a kind of a palette of like, these are other covers that I think would be somewhat appropriate. And most of them were fairly vintage covers, like old, mm -hmm. like, you know, um, old FSG covers and old Penguin covers and stuff like that. Um, and I sent in, yeah. And so none, the first round didn't really work out, but in the second round, uh, uh, this was one of the options. Um, I think it didn't have the blue in the type um, oh. then, but um, it, it was, I, I thought that's the one, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it, it stuck out to me. Um, yeah. And I like, I love the like background texture that has like mm -hmm. a smoky quality. Yeah, um, which could be- If you get the book, you'll be able to see it really clearly. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, it really stands out. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. Uh, question for you, Alexandra. Okay. Should this be our last question, Lisa? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> okay. One of my favorite lines in your novel is slotted for that. So Ithaca, this town is a giant Reuben sandwich from an eager old white woman with loose teeth. I need to know if this interaction that precedes this line actually happened. And if you remember where it happened, this is just entirely too. Ith yep. Uh, yes, this interaction did happen at one of my favorite diners, which now lo no longer exists, uh, Hal's in on that used to be on Aurora. Yeah. And I think it was like, every time we went in there, it felt like there were like three or four generations of the same family who were hanging out in there. Um, the latkes. Yeah. Yeah. They were so good. And now it's a nail salon with very fluorescent lights. I mean, I haven't been there, so it could be a really good nail salon, but I still miss house. <laughs> All right. That. Thank you guys so, so much. Um, it's been really fun hanging out with you. I think we have a great new idea for a new podcast <laughs> on covers. Um, we'll recruit Eleanor Henderson to do that with us when we get it started. And uh, thank you everybody for attending. Um, I hope we see all of you in the bookstore someday soon when we can be in the bookstore again. And in the meantime, Eleanor and I both posted the link so you can buy books. Um, and on our website, you can also find information about the upcoming events. So thanks so much. Um, Michael, be well. We hope to see you sometime. Alexandra, we will see you soon. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank you. <laughs>